Um, but for now, I would like to introduce our moderator, Bob Hargreaves. He is a partner at BB&K and practices municipal land use and energy law. He's on the board of directors of the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership and is one of the founders of the Renewable Energy Roundtable. He's on the boards and involved with too many Coachella Valley organizations to name, and we're honored to have such an illustrious member of our community uh, guiding tonight's discussion. So I'll pass you the reins. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I've been a longtime resident here at the Coachella Valley, and I'm often a participant in the, uh, the different series they have at UCR, so almost all the time I'm sitting on, this, uh, on the other side out there where you are, so it's a be interesting experience for me tonight to be on this side of the microphone. Um, just in terms of full disclosure, the firm I represent or work with represents a number of public agencies, including three of the water agencies out here in the Coachella Valley, so that to one extent informs my perspective. But on the other hand, I'm a ratepayer uh, with CVWD, so um, I recently had to sacrifice my lawn to to save my beloved fruit trees, so I share your pain in terms of water rates here in the Coachella Valley. And tonight we have uh, a distinguished panel of three speakers that are going to provide uh, some context for you in terms of what's going on really statewide with water and um, you know water pricing and just making sure that we have the water that we need to, to go forward with the California economy. And to give an idea of what you know, people throughout the state are thinking about water pricing and the investments that we need to make in our water infrastructure, and then uh, you know, drill down on kind of the economics of, of water and pricing and whatnot. And I'll introduce the panelists one, is, one at a time as they come up, and they'll give their presentations. Um, and then if you have questions, once again, write them down on those three by five cards. And once all the presentations are done, we're going to bring them up here. We're going to sit down and we're going to have a little kind of a panel discussion, and we're going to go over those questions. So uh, let's get started. Our first speaker tonight is Kathleen Teagues. Kathleen has uh, the remarkable uh, honor and challenge of representing, she's the president right now of the um, Association of California Water Agencies, known as ACWA. There's, what, 450 members from all over this state, and they represent a variety and diverse and you know distinct interest, and she's got the challenge of kind of kind of herding them all and corralling them all and trying to get them to to operate as one unit in terms of going to Sacramento and presenting um, the water agency perspective in Sacramento as far as water policy is concerned. So she's traveling all over the state now, hearing from Californians about um, you know what people think about water, what they think about their water pricing, what they think about the water future. So she's going to bring. Uh, you know, valuable statewide perspective. Um, before being president of Aqua, she served on the Cucamonga Valley, Valley Water District uh, for several years, and so she has the the perspective of being, you know, a water board member, a water agency board member. But before that, for 30 years, she uh, worked with a public agency that provided uh, water. So she's got a depth of experience. So, Kathleen, would you, you. join? Well, good evening, everyone, or I, should, I guess I should still say good afternoon. And Ashley, thank you for coordinating this, and UCR, thank you for this beautiful facility. I see a lot of familiar faces out here, so I'm glad you're here to support me, and I'm going to take one for the Gipper. Any tomatoes, I've got them for you, so don't worry about that. Um, as John said, I have blood, water in my blood, literally and figuratively, so after a long 30 plus year career with a wholesale water agency, then being elected to Cucamonga Valley Water District in 05, where I currently serve. I also got involved uh, with California Special Districts and was seated on their statewide board. And then, as he said, I have the pleasure of serving as president of the board at the Association of California Water Agencies. And when that gavel was handed to me at the fall conference out here, actually last December, I made a commitment to all the Aqua members, 430 of them, that I would put boots in their camp over the next two years to hear their story. So far, I have 50 of them under my belt, and uh, it's just amazing to see throughout this great state how we are one state 
we are one water. Sometimes we, come, we become siloed and think, oh my gosh, this is only happening to us. We're the only ones that are having to take our grass out. We're the only ones that are being asked to cut back. But I hope that my presentation will share with you that you're not alone, that we are one state, that we have some big issues to face, some monumental decisions to be made this year as to the future economy of this great state and what we're going to do with our water supply. So before I get started, I'm just curious, how many in, in joining us tonight, how, how many of you enjoyed a nice lunch this afternoon? Just kind of kicked back and had a nice lunch, maybe had a glass of water with that lunch. And when we get done tonight, I'll bet you there's a couple in this audience that are probably going to go home and maybe go out and probably enjoy a nice glass of wine. Am I out? Yeah, but got a couple of hands on that one. So just for the, those that you may not know, it takes about 32 gallons of water to produce one glass of wine. 32 gallons of water, that's about 160 gallons of water to produce one bottle of wine. So you look at that red wine or the white wine and you really kind of say, well, I'm drinking wine, so I'm conserving water. But in reality, we are using water. And I also learned a very interesting fact today. My sister was over visiting from Hawaii and she shared with me that it takes one half million gallons of water, half a million gallons, produce, to produce one pound of sugar. So it kind of puts into perspective when rate increases come at us and you're saying, why am I having to pay more? Why is water going to cost me more? Water is used for a lot more than just quenching our thirst and keeping us alive longer than three days. So with that, let me get underway. As I shared, I serve on the board with the Association of California Water Agencies, as you see, um, responsible for 90% of the state's water that's distributed in our state. That's a lot. We're public agencies. We do not have mutual water companies or for-profit water companies as part of our association. Uh, we provide advocacy, federal, state, and local projects. Surface and groundwater, I'm sure through your newspaper, maybe some of you have seen Sigma or the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which I know it's impacting this area out here. We agricultural, urban, industrial customers, so we represent the gamut from the members of Aqua and also the wholesale and resale, retail agencies. As I said, we're public non-for-profit agencies governed by locally elected officials. And if you don't know the officials that are in here tonight, I would encourage you to stop them before they leave and get to know them and get to know your elected board members for your respective water districts. They are a wealth of knowledge and they can help you to understand the true value of water. We also plan and, I'm sorry, the rate payers um, in your respective water districts are also responsible for the infrastructure and those that may not be familiar with infrastructure, just look at it as the pipelines that get the water. So when you turn that tap on in the morning or you get into that shower and turn that water on, there is water, a reliable supply and of good quality. And they're also stewards of local rate payer dollars. Water agencies take their responsibilities seriously. And I would ask everyone that, unfortunately there are a few that have been in the news over the last few years that put a, a dark light on water agencies. Trust me, they are far and few between, and openness and transparency is the key and the motto that water agencies live by. Again, I encourage you, get to know your agencies. So as far as transparency, as you know, how many in this room have attended a board meeting of your local water district? How many of you attend that meeting when it's not a Prop 218 hearing? <laughs> oh, there are a few, thank you. Um, they are very interesting and fact-filled. So again, don't just go when there's a hot issue and you're wondering why the rates are going up. Go and learn more about your district. And who knows, one day, one day you may be sitting on that board. Board members, elected officials, if you're not aware, must complete regular ethics training and we must file forms with the Federal Fair Political Practices Commission, which is the FPPC. Patrick, how are you? Good to see you. Patrick O'Dowd, that's another elected official. Now I'm pointing out, Patrick, so they know right where you are. <laughs> um, 
Agencies, all, obviously all of our records are audited to ensure that the public funds are managed properly. So again, it's your dollars that you have entrusted the board of directors and staff at the respective districts to use efficiently and by the law to operate their systems and get that water delivered to you. And they are accountable to the local voters. You're the ones that put them in office, you are the, one, you are the ones that will continue to leave them in office, or you are the ones that will decide that it's time for a change and remove them from office. So a lot goes into getting that water to you 24-7, 365 days a year. Unless you don't pay your bill, then you might have a slight interruption. But outside of that, those pumps are running and the water is there when you need it. Regular maintenance and complex water systems. If you could go in and if we all could be Superman for a day and use our x-ray vision and look into the menagerie of pipelines and, and the web of pipelines that are below us that take water everywhere you need it, it is truly amazing that those systems are maintained, they are checked, they are cleaned, uh, when something gets clogged or pipelines break and need to be replaced, um, it's just amazing what's underground. Advanced water treatment, this is key. The regulatory agencies seem to think that um, water treatment needs to be taken up several levels and to treat the new constituents that are in the water according to the federal agencies. And when they make those choices, that means new treatment plants need to be built or modifications need to be made, not by the district's choosing because we meet standards, we're drinking that water, but they feel that they need to be elevated. So in comes uh, retrofits, new construction, new treatment plants. I know that for my district, Cucamonga Valley Water District, we just completed construction of a $40 million upgrade to our water treatment plant not by our choosing, but by regulatory um, guidelines that had been changed, and we now had to amend our treatment process to meet those. So 40 million, we did it, it's behind us, and we will move on now. And the, the public was in support of that. Investments in new technology, infrastructure, and resources, as I've just alluded to, those are always changing and your water districts are ahead of the game and very proactive in making sure that the water you drink is right there for you. So since the 90s, water agencies have invested close to 20 billion with a B dollars to upgrade water systems, to build their water treatment plants, again, everything it takes to get that water to you. Investing from water recycling to water use efficiency to storage to desalination. I know that there is recycled water used out in this area. I believe as I travel the area, you do see purple pipes out there, which is great. Uh, you'll have areas that are in close proximity to wastewater treatment plants or resource plants as they're now referred to, and you'll see much more purple pipe out there. But for all the recycled water that's used, that's making the potable water more available for your consumption. And the recycled water, if you're not aware, only gets used on landscaping and industrial processes. It's not coming into the home and you're not drinking that yet. These local investments uh, protected the state's overall economy during the drought. Don't be alarmed by the comment that I just made. You're not drinking it yet. Um, there is Orange County, which I'll reference them in a moment down in Orange County. They've got a treatment plant that's bringing nationwide attention to them and they are doing that very thing, treating the wastewater. It's going down into the ground and then coming back up again, and that is their supply source. And everybody's still alive and everybody's still smiling, so it's a good source. Local water agencies, there's some of the things that they use their dollars to invest in the future. Again, you have people moving in, there's an abundance of water, you've got to build that infrastructure to deliver the water maintain and repair and upgrade the infrastructure. I've alluded to that. Develop drought resilient supplies. That goes back to the recycled water, the purple pipe in the lower left corner. Again, everyone's gonna be flushing, everyone's gonna be taking showers. That water will always be there and they're using that. 
They're making their water systems more efficient, going out and looking for leaks, preventing the leaks from going down, the uh, silent leaks, as we call them, that may be going underground that we're not aware of. And the most important thing is they continue to deliver that high quality drinking water that you rely on 24-7, 365 days a year. So I've asked a couple, or a couple people have asked me, so why the increase in the cost of water? And I always like telling people, water's free. There is no cost for the water. The water comes from the heavens, or the water comes from an underground spring. The cost for the water comes in getting that water treated and distributed and delivered to the residents and the businesses. The list that's in front of you there shows what drives the cost of water. As I alluded to earlier, you've got compliance with drinking water standards, such as Chrome 6, and I know that's been in the news out here in this area. You've got the system maintenance and repair. We have an aging infrastructure throughout this state. Um, you kind of forget what's underground because again, the water that's coming through to your home is still clean, but attention needs to be paid, be paid to the underground piping. Water treatment costs continue to go up. The energy water nexus, people are starting to realize that everybody doesn't have the luxury of having gravity flow to get the water into their system. So energy is required. And we all know energy continues to go up even in your own home use. Investments in drought resilient supplies, as we talked about earlier with the recycled water and environmental requirements that are driving. So you can have a regulatory drought or you can have a man-made drought. So consider that when you're looking at all the impacts and the cost of water. Increases in energy, gas, and material costs, all associated with water on a much grander scale. Uh, these costs affect the amount you pay in your monthly water bill. And I know people say that within water districts, well, if you'd get rid of half of your staff and if you'd stop paying those exorbitant salaries, I think if you look at private and public agencies, there is not much difference in salary levels, number one. And the bulk of the revenue received from water sales in agencies goes back to, again, treating and delivering that water to you. Another reason to get involved with your district and learn about how they disperse their funds. Drafts are costly for wa local water agencies. Why? Well, we talked a little bit before about um, upgrading infrastructure and all, but when you do that, such as Cucamonga Valley, so we just had to spend $40 million, not that we had that in our reserves, and now over the years, that becomes a fixed cost for us that we need to pay back. And that fixed cost requires rate on the commodity charge or what you pay per unit of water for Cucamonga Valley. One of the drivers there. Unbudgeted costs and outreach and rebate, rebates. This year, uh, I'm sure you didn't open the paper many days where there wasn't uh, headline news about the State Water Resources Control Board and the reductions that they had imposed on all of the water districts, some as high as reducing their demand by 38% from the, where they were in the year 2013. Others had, out on the coast, some of them had to only reduce 10%. But unfortunately, the state, when they imposed this, looked at the state as a whole and didn't consider that maybe out here in the Coachella Valley, it gets to be 110 or 120 in the summer. I don't think it gets that way in Cambria or Santa Barbara or Ventura. But everyone out in this area has done a phenomenal job in doing their part, and thank you for removing your grass. Enforcement of water restrictions. Again, this was imposed on the water districts. It's not something the water districts chose to do because Southern California as a whole have been overly aggressive in putting water into the ground and preparing for times of drought. A lot of the agencies had water to get us through this last two or three years, but it was the state board that came back to us and said, sorry, you can't use that water that you've got sitting in the ground. You've got to reduce your consumption even more to help those agencies and those areas that maybe don't have the water. So we did what we were told, otherwise there would have been a, a healthy fine imposed on us. Purchase of supplemental supplies, that relates to your source supply. So some agencies <coughs> out here, you have a beautiful groundwater basin, which just consider it like a big bathtub filled with water. 
Others have not only groundwater, but what we refer to as imported water, so water that may come from the Colorado River or in other parts of Southern California, you've got water that comes down the uh, State Water Project, which is coming through the San Joaquin Delta. That is what we mean by supplemental supplies. If you're fortunate to be below a watershed and you've got the snow melt, melt coming down, that's another source of water to you. And again, as we alluded to, lost revenue as a result of mandatory conservation. Again, what the state mandated that the respective water agencies do. So the drought's not over. Actually, I, as I was coming out here, the Caltrans had one of their signs flashing. Again, California in severe drought save water. We keep hearing on the news that they are releasing water out of Shasta. They've released water out of Folsom. They've released water out of Lake Oroville. And by the regulations, they have to prepare those reservoirs for snow melt. So they have so much clearance that they have to have at the top, even though the snow's not melting. And it's, it's alarming, I learned this week, that over one million gallons now, no, excuse me, 100 million gallons, 100 million gallons have now gone out to the ocean from the releases off these lakes and reservoirs and, and that I just alluded to. That's just wrong, wrong. But we're working to resolve that issue. Some of the adjustments to the state's emergency conservation regulation are possible in May. The State Water Resources Control Board is meeting today uh, to see if they will reduce some of the percentages by which we need to uh, reduce our conservation. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed. And then invest investment in drought supplies, which we alluded to. So here's some of the local investments that have been made within Southern California. So you've got Diamond Valley Lake, which many of you may be familiar with over in the Hemet area. That holds 800,000 acre feet of water when it's full. When I saw it two weeks ago, it was a third full because they only fill that reservoir from imported water coming down from the state. It is the largest reservoir in California. You have Contra Costa Water District, CCWD, Los Vaqueros, which has 160,000 acre feet to store water for emergency supplies. Then you've got Irvine Ranch Water District, Carlsbad, the desal plant that's just opened up down near San Diego, Orange County, that's what I was referring to, the re groundwater replenishment, and Mesa Water also has a reliability facility that they're storing water and holding it for times of emergency. So 59% of the surveyed agencies raised their rates in 2015 due to the drought. Again, not what we chose, what was imposed upon us. Another 33% plan to raise their rates in 2016. Water is not, water is cheap, and people don't appreciate the value of water, and it's been undervalued for a long time. Here's a comparison for you to show from the Bay Area. You've got San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County, Inland Empire, Central California, and at the bottom of the rung, you have Coachella Valley. So you have got the lowest rates looking throughout the state of California. So congratulations to you. I wish I lived in Coachella Valley. Hopefully you can read all that's on there. <clears throat> so here gives you an idea of what some of the rate increases are coming again throughout the state. San Diego, $6 per month. Zone 7, which is up in the Central Valley area, they're almost $8 a month increase on their rates. City of Sacramento, there you see, is $5 a month. LA Department of Water and Power will increase by $4.20 a month. But look at that, 2016 to 2020. So they're going out four or five years. East Bay, that's up in the San Francisco area, they did a two-year increase, as you can read there. I don't need to restate that. And Contra Costa Water District, again, they're increasing by $2 per month. And a lot of people increased just because of the drought. So some key takeaways for you today. Water is expensive, but it's an essential resource. Uh, people don't have a problem paying $100 plus a month for their cable bill or to have all the smartphones or all the techie, but I don't think eating a cell phone is going to keep me alive for three days, and I definitely want my water. Um, local water agencies are doing everything they can to keep their costs low, and trust me, we are doing everything we can. We are the stewards of the people, and we are accountable to the people, and it is their money that we are working with. 
The cost of delivery is water is increasing. So again, you've got your nexus with your energy and your water. Water doesn't all flow by gravity flow. Clean, safe, reliable water, definitely worth the investment. Just remember that glass of wine you're gonna enjoy later tonight. So yes, water service costs money, but not having it can cost a lot more. We're definitely not Flint, Michigan. So with that, I say thank you very much. I could share a lot more with you, but in respect of my fellow panelists, I will close for now and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kathleen. And there, there again, once again, uh, John's got these three by five cards out there. If you have questions, just kind of raise your hand. John will collect them. And when we're through the three speakers, we'll go through those and try to answer your questions. Okay, our next speaker this evening is Adam Probolski. Uh, Adam is a pollster. And if you've been following the news, the pollsters are in much demand these days on the, on the various candidates. But Adam, uh, his research is more in, in public policy. Um, and he is the CEO of Probolski Research, a full service opinion research and strategy firm specializing in public policy and working on behalf of business, government, labor, political, media, and special interest clients. He has acted as a pollster and strategic advisor in matters of public policy, legislation, elections, and business. Um, and he also, he's from Orange County, and he serves on a number of boards and commissions there. And we brought him here tonight as living proof that you can drink recycled water and survive. So thank you, Adam, for coming here. Um, and Adam's going to uh, go into some of his polling that he's done recently in terms of uh, water attitudes and, and what people are thinking in California in terms of making the, the kind of investment and the, and the hard choices we're going to have to make in terms of water policy going forward. So please welcome Adam. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we just recently had the chance to go out in the field to do a statewide poll and ask some questions to California voters on the subject of water. And uh, so I'll release or reveal some of those results here to this evening and then bring it kind of back home here to reveal some results uh, that we have here from the Coachella Valley and then uh, take it uh, from around the state, uh, some other results as well. So um, first I will, let's see here how this works. So first give you a little bit of uh, the behind the scenes of how the poll was, was conducted in California. Um, we, we polled a thousand people and um, uh, that means that um, we, we talked to people in both English and Spanish. We talked to people on their landlines and their cell phones, which is something very important these days. Um, if you talk to people on just their landlines, you kind of miss out on some younger people and you miss out on uh, certain ethnic groups oftentimes. Um, and so kind of just important things to note when you're looking at polls. Um, so statewide, we ask people what's top of mind. And this is kind of important um, just to see representative of the, uh, the, the words people use. Um, Interestingly enough, water does show up uh, in the number one, the, the top words people use. You can see it right there. Crime also shows up, jobs show up. We call this the word cloud. Um, housing shows up. But if you look at it from a number standpoint, the number one issue people care about statewide is public safety, jobs, but number three is water. Um, and then things kind of fall off from there. Um, we, um, showed this slide to Tim Quinn, the, uh, the, the CEO, I guess, of uh, Aqua, um, and um, a few months ago, and this was kind of concerning to us, and it, it uh, as someone who is policy uh, researchers that are very interested in the water business, um, if you can see, back in January of 2012, since we've been tracking this issue, the, the top issue in California, um, open-ended what people really care about. 3% um, of people were saying water was the top issue. And you can see as the drought kind of started to become a, a big factor and as you saw news agencies and, and public agencies like water districts really push this issue of a drought. The top issue 
became water and crescendoed in April 2015. And that was probably as every freeway sign and every news agency was talking drought. And then it kind of dropped off in February of 2016. Um, it really uh, hasn't recovered, and it probably won't, quite frankly, because there's this fatigue, quite frankly, that um, voters are just kind of like, kind of saying, "All right, enough already. We get it. There's a drought. Um, we're and you know, you're kind of representative, quite frankly, of, of voters, I guess. Um, so." Uh, there, there may be this idea that um, there's a missed moment in time and uh, we may not be able to get it back, but uh, the fact that you folks are here and interested enough in it perhaps means that um, water agencies can, can keep the momentum going, but there, there, there was a moment in time where, where it was the top issue in California, um, no longer, uh, but there, there's definitely a need to keep people interested in, in water issues. Um, Interesting question we asked, uh, would you be willing to pay higher water rates to ensure safe, reliable, high quality, high quality supply of water, drinking water, that is, in your community? Um, the, the answer obviously depends on a whole lot of factors, uh, but statewide, 41% say yes, 51% say no. Um, if you're a uh, water board member or, or you're an advocate like uh, someone who is with Aqua, you may be disappointed with these results. You may perhaps wish the, the results were different or flipped. Um, I guess maybe you can be encouraged by the fact that 41% say they'd be willing to pay higher rates. Uh, again, depending on the community you're in, these numbers are, are different. But 41% uh, statewide say yes and, and half say no. Um, and uh, I'll go back. Um, you've got seven or eight percent that say they're unsure. If this was an election, let's say, uh, and you're trying to win an election, these aren't horrible numbers, right? If you're, let's say, uh, you know, Ted Cruz and, and Donald Trump, um, you know, and you're, you're in the Ted Cruz campaign, uh, you might say, okay, we could probably pull this thing off. Uh, we got to, you know, do a good ground game and, and work the, the, you know, uh, work, work, the, uh, work the election and, and we can maybe be able to get there from here. Uh, but the, the bottom line is uh, the no's have it. And if you're a, um, uh, someone trying to pass, let's say, a higher rate structure, this is not a very good slide for, for the guys trying to pass higher rates on a statewide basis. Um, so maybe one of the reasons why, uh, is there a water bond on in November? No, maybe one of the reasons why there's not a water bond on in November. Um, all right, the next slide is kind of interesting for, for us. Uh, we asked what, in your opinion, is the largest component of water costs? And uh, we didn't have a real particular agenda in this. We just wanted to know what the voters thought was the highest, you know, the reasons for, for water costs. And uh, I think they kind of got it, uh, that the fixed cost of operating and maintaining, upgrading local water systems, uh, like pipes and things like that, I actually think that is the right answer. Is, is uh, any, are there any experts in the room that uh, think, J John thinks that, that we're right? Um, and, and I'm not sure if they're totally accurate on the other things on the list, but um, it gives a sense of what the California voters think are, are the costs uh, and, and what the percentages are associated with them. Um, and this may be, from a, a policymaker standpoint and from a staff standpoint, kind of a homework uh, lesson to go out and educate the public as to really what the costs really are and kind of associate uh, what the costs really are for these things. It, I, I have a sense that I bet you staff is probably lower on the list than it probably is from a, um, from a voter perspective. And uh, for instance, the price of imported water uh, for Southern California is probably higher on the percentage list, uh, depending on where you are in the state uh, and things like that. So kind of interesting way of looking at it and, and gives you a perspective from what the voters think these things cost. So um, these next question, um, we, we pose a question and we have very different results depending on the place in, 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 the, in the state. But um, we, we pose a, a statement and we ask people to agree or disagree. And I'll read it because it's, it's really kind of an important one because it's very relevant to a lot of agencies. We say local water districts are acting responsibly 
when they maintain multi-million dollar infrastructure replacement funds in order to maintain and operate and replace their infrastructure. These districts are planning for the future by setting aside money that they know they, they need for regular projects and in case of emergencies. It's okay with me that they maintain, maintain these funds even as they raise my rates to pay for the costs of water and regular operations. 41, or we round up, 42% say they agree, 45% say they disagree. So we get, like I said, very different results depending on the community. And here's what this question, this statement really is saying. You've got agencies, and essentially what they're doing is they, they put dollars away in the bank in case, let's say, an earthquake hits. And they've got multi-million, they've got perhaps tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure in the ground, pipes and, and um, plants and physical operations that, let's say an earthquake were to hit, they would have to replace. And in theoretically, they ought to have millions of dollars in reserves in order to replace those things. Um, we ask people, is it okay for them to have, let's say, 20 or 30 or 50 or more million dollars in the bank to be able to replace those, those infrastructure if something were to happen or to have replacement funds? It's theoretically the responsible thing to do. Um, but at the same time, over here, we have these regular operations that we've got to keep funding. Um, and in order to do that, we should be able to raise rates in order to kind of have those operations. Um, in a lot of places, people agree. Statewide, we're seeing people saying, no, we don't agree. Uh, so we thought that was kind of interesting and it's kind of useful, I think, for policymakers on a statewide basis to see these numbers. On a district per district basis, we see most people uh, that we survey uh, agreeing with the, with the answer. Uh, the intensity here is kind of interesting. Um, I think this will show up. Uh, tw you know, 30 or 26 percent say they strongly disagree. And again, these are statewide numbers. Um, so let's look for some regional attitudes. Um, this is some surveys we've done kind of recently here in the Coachella Valley. By the way, each of the Coachella Valley uh, agencies are, are clients of ours through CV Water Counts. Um, so this is kind of that word, word, word cloud. We asked the top issue of concern to, to you. And here in the Coachella Valley, water comes out in a big, big way. And then drought as well, you can see, stands out in a big, big, big way. People are concerned. And you can certainly see other issues that people care about, crime and, and education and other things that kind of show up on the, on the list. Uh, if we go forward, I brought this one in from a, a survey that was a little bit older in the Coachella Valley from a couple of years ago, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting as a proxy. We asked, in your opinion, which of the following best reasons to conserve water? And, and I know it's not exactly on topic, it's about water conservation, but I thought it was kind of interesting because if you look at the list, why would you conserve water? And this is amongst you folks, your Coachella Valley residents, and it says, well, I'm going to conserve water because it's going to ensure water supplies for the future. Uh, that's the top answer. Uh, not being wasteful, I think that's a good answer. Uh, protecting local water uh, sources. And down pretty darn close to the bottom, uh, right just above on shore, is saving money. So I look at this kind of as a proxy for this, this talking about dollars and cents. The last answer people gave us was saving money. So it wasn't even you know, one, two, or three. It was the fourth answer they gave us was the reason for, for, for uh, conserving water was saving money. Um, obviously, there's better answers to give, but essentially the, the proxy answer is um, that, that you folks don't think that the dollars and cents is the reason for, for conserving water. Um, I think it's very relevant to the, the rate conversation. So um, I'm going to take us outside of the Coachella Valley now. Uh, this takes us to this slide takes us to East Valley Water District, which is just uh, I guess north and east of here, or north and west of here a bit, uh, to Highland. And uh, we ask people if they agree or disagree with the statement. Uh, water supply uh, is always an issue in drought-prone California, and while water conservation is important, 
it's uh, only part of the solution. We need to make major infrastructure uh, investments in modernization and modernize and upgrade our water infrastructure to ensure local, safe, reliable, high quality water now and in the future. 91% of, of uh, East Valley Water District uh, uh, ratepayers agree with that statement. Now, granted, I didn't tell them I was raising their rates by $10 a month or 10 cents a month or hundred dollars a year or whatever it was, I just told them that statement and I asked them if they agree or disagree. Um, Ninety-one percent, you know, agree. That's kind of puppies and kittens territory. Um, it's, it's, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty high. You don't get 91 percent of people to agree on anything. Um, so now we're going to go all the way up to Nevada County. Yes, there's a Nevada County, California. Um, and Again, we say, um, now please tell me if you agree or disagree with the statement. Uh, we prepare for uh, natural disasters like earthquakes by uh, constructing buildings that uh, can withstand them. Uh, we should also prepare for water shortages by constructing water infrastructure that will uh, ensure local, safe, reliable, high quality water now and in the future. Do you agree or disagree? Again, 94% we round up. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty big percentages um, and people there are supporting a major infrastructure project. Uh, there they are building a dam. Um, that, uh, that's not very uh, common that we're building dams in, Cal in, well, in the United States, quite frankly. And in California, it's even less common uh, in 2016 to build a major infrastructure project like that. But in, in, uh, up in the Nevada Irrigation District, they're building a dam. So um, moving to uh, Marin Municipal Water District, we're gonna stay up there for a minute and then we'll come back down to Southern California. In general, do you support Marine Municipal Water District's efforts to maintain and modernize its water infrastructure, such as pipes, tanks, pump stations, even if it means raising rates? All right, so now I start talking about raising people's rates. 78, we'll round out to 79, 79% support it. So I'm asking people if, I'm gonna, if I can raise their rates, and 79% say yes. I only have, at this point, 15% of people saying that they're opposing rates, raising their rates. Now, I'm not trying to convince you to raise your rates. I'm just telling you that that's pretty darn impressive that, that um, uh, they're, they're um, opposing, only 15% opposing their uh, rates, raising their rates. So coming back down to Southern California, we're going to go over just west of here to Santa Margarita Water District and stay there for a few, a few uh, questions. There's a lot of words here, but the interesting part here is there's a lot of discussion since the drought has come in uh, to play about agencies trying to recover fixed costs. And I don't know if anybody here has kind of had this discussion, but as, uh, as, the, uh, as people are using less water, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the bills have, uh, a lot of bills have basically um, sort, of, sort of come down essentially to some degree. But agencies have had to figure out a way where, where uh, ratepayers are using less water, um, and they've been uh, needing to figure out a way to recover the fixed costs of providing water. And before, they were kind of just kind of making it up in volume, and now these agencies have to figure out how to say, wait a second, the, the bills are coming down, but we're still having this cost of providing water. And they weren't really charging ratepayers the actual cost of delivering the water. It was just kind of made up in the volume of it. So they're saying, okay, we've got to actually start adding the actual cost of providing the water. And it may only be um, a few do more dollars a month uh, in some cases. In a lot of cases, it's maybe three, four, five, or six dollars more a month. But that could be four or five or eight or, you know, that could be, you know, 10% more or 18% more on your bill, which sounds dramatic. But um, so what this question is basically saying over the course of several questions we're asking these, these uh, rate payers, is it, is it okay, do you support this new rate structure? And Santa Margarita uh, Water District uh, rate payers, 62% of them uh, are, whoops, are, are saying in this question, they're saying yes. Uh, over the course of the poll, they were saying yes, they support it. Um, 
The next set of questions were the sixth question we asked Santa Margarita Water District members. We posed it in another way. We posed it Parker versus Michaels. Um, and in this way, we try to explain to them, um, Parker says, I support Santa Margarita Water District's new rate structure. Water conservation is critical to our community. Uh, new rate structure gives financial incentives to those who conserve water, and those who waste water have to pay more. It's only fair to treat everyone equally while planning for our future to protect our water supplies. And then Michaels, who takes a much more contrarian approach, says, uh, I don't support the new rate structure. It's not fair that our water, water rates keep going up, and the less water we use, the more we pay. Here comes in this, this fixed rate structure, this fixed cost that basically I use less, but I'm paying more. Um, and I'm being told to stay within a water budget. Again, they're telling me I've got to use a certain, if I use a certain amount, I'm going to pay more. Um, mandated by the district, or I'll be charged even more. Who do, you, who do you support? And again, the rate, the rate payers have kind of gotten this concept that I get it, I'm going to pay a fixed amount, and I've got to use a certain amount or I'm going to pay more. And they, they kind of have bought into this idea, and they agree with Parker. Um, this agency has done a very good job of doing outreach and explaining their position, and they've, they've agreed with the guy who says, I get it, I'm going to be paying a little bit more, but I understand why. And then I think we're pretty darn close here to the end. Um, we've got another scenario under which they agree with, with, um, uh, with, with, with Wilson, uh, who says, I support the new rate structure. Everyone should pay equally infrastructure through the fixed rates. The water budgets are a good way for individual households to, uh, and businesses to control their own water use and water costs. There's nothing complicated about the new rate structure. It's just more realistic, more fair for residents. Smith, on the other hand, was basically saying you need an advanced degree to understand the, the rate structure. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the old rate structure. Um, look, trying to understand these new bills sometimes can be complicated. Uh, it takes agencies doing very specific outreach. And um, there's, at times, uh, I think, uh, as you'll hear other speakers or you'll, you've heard, um, agencies use consultants. Um, and I think you're going to hear from a consultant uh, today. I'm a consultant myself. And um, so there's sometimes this idea that uh, agencies paying for consultants is the easiest way for them to save money. Um, and they should cut consultants. Well, unfortunately, in order to explain some of these, these complicated structures, they sometimes need to hire uh, evil consultants like me to, to do some outreach or to explain what they're doing. Um, and maybe even evil lawyers um, also to, to uh, explain what they're, uh, what they're trying to make sure that they stay on course. So um, this, this, um, this slide kind of explains that uh, perhaps that that's necessary. So with that, um, I think I'll, I'll pass the, the, uh, the little clicker off, and hopefully there'll be some time for Q&A later. All right, well, thank you, Adam. Uh, and then once again, we've got the three by five cards. So if you have specific questions for Adam, uh, John will go around and collect them. And, and we'll uh, put it to him here in a few minutes. OK, next up, uh, we have Ken Barenclaw. Now, Ken is a water economist. So he's going to talk to us about uh, why water costs what it does and water pricing and how uh, consumers respond to the, the different prices in terms of conservation. Um, and Ken is an associate professor of environmental economics and policy in the School of Public Policy and the Associate Provost of UC Riverside. So he's over in, in Riverside. Uh, he's a member of this great institution, the University of California at Riverside. He also is a cooperating faculty member in the Departments of Economics and Environmental Sciences and the Ogden Fellow of the Water Policy Center of Public Policy Institute of California. And he sits on a number of boards and writes a bunch, and he's our water expert. So. Ken, tell us uh, why we're facing the increases we're facing and, and what they do to our consumption and whatever else you can. So. Well, that's going to be some big shoes to fill. Well, I'll see if I can do it. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ken Barenclaw, and I'm going to talk about pricing. In fact, 
I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, the very price mechanism that Adam uh, had done some of his surveying on. Sometimes it's called water budgets. I refer to it as allocation-based rates. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about different ways to price water, the challenge of doing it well, and then spend some time describing how these innovative water budget rate structures have affected water demand in a couple uh, Southern California water districts that we've been working with on some research projects. So um, I'm going to start by putting a question up here that I'm not going to answer. How should water be priced? That's actually a tough question. Instead of giving you an answer, I'm going to talk about the factors that agencies think about, competing factors, when they're trying to decide not just what the price level should be, but what kind of rate structure to use. And here's a few of them that I put up here. Three, three things that I think if you talk to most any agency would be on their list of, of the different things that they're trying to balance. And the first one is something economists refer to as efficiency. And what we mean is that um, prices are used throughout our economy for various reasons, but one of the nice things that prices do is they send a signal to consumers that if you want to consume more, if you want to buy more, somebody else has got to make a sacrifice. Maybe it's the water district that has to deliver that water to you and there's a cost associated with it. Maybe there's um, an agricultural producer who's going to forego that water so it can stay in the statewide system and come down here to Southern California for somebody to use. But there's a sacrifice. There's an opportunity cost, right? And that signal tends to cause resources to be put to their most highly valued uses. All right? Because as the price goes up, it's only those users with those high values who will continue to agree to pay that price. Lower valued uses no longer make economic sense. Right? And this idea goes back to this famous economist, Adam Smith, who referred to this as the invisible hand of the market back in his uh, famous book in 1776. And so this idea permeates our economy and prices are a, a widely relied upon resource allocation mechanism. So when we talk about efficiency, we're talking about sending signals to the economy that cause our limited resources to go to the most highly valued uses, and that includes water. So that's one thing that we care about, is, is sending the right signal about water scarcity and encouraging its use in highly valued places and discouraging it in lower valued places. Another thing that water districts care about is, is equity. So we can talk about, on the one hand, higher prices perhaps being good because they send that signal about water scarcity, but if you don't have much of an ability to pay for water, that's not good for you. And so water districts care a lot about equity, too, and ensuring affordability for essential uses. And so you can start to see that there's already this conflict where you might like to raise prices when water is, is scarce during a drought to send that signal that there's an opportunity cost of using water today, and it's higher than it was when we had full reservoirs. But you'd also like to keep water prices low in order to ensure affordability for disadvantaged communities. Third, you'll hear a lot about financial stability. And it might be the case that neither a high price nor a low price is going to cause the balance sheet for uh, your agency to clear. Uh, you might get excess profits with a high price. You might run a deficit with a low price. And so these three things are in competition with each other. And there's more things that we could put on the list as well. But these are just three to give you an idea of why setting a price is a challenging thing to do. You're trying to send an efficiency signal, you're trying to be fair, you're trying to balance your budget, and you've got this one instrument that you're using, your price structure, okay? So a challenging thing to do, and that's why I'm not going to answer the question. So, some common ways that agencies try to go about setting rates. And so I'm gonna go through four different rate structures that are fairly common, and then talk about their commonality in California. So first of all, one approach is a flat rate, and that's just where every customer gets a fixed bill every month, okay? One reason why that's good is because, is because that is close to the cost structure of an agency. It's largely fixed costs. So Adam also addressed that. He talked about the fact that customers seem to realize that agencies have high fixed costs. And in terms of achieving financial stability, you'd like to have a fixed component of your revenues to cover the fixed component of your costs, right? But if we've got all of our revenue wrapped up in a flat rate, a fixed cost, we're sending a very low scarcity signal through our price to our customers that water is scarce. So one way we can get around that problem is to switch from a flat rate to a uniform rate. And a lot of you may pay a uniform rate around here. That's where you have to pay per unit, but the cost per unit is constant. You can consume as much as you want and you keep paying $2 per unit, $2 per unit, no matter how much you consume. 
Well, one of the problems with that is that if we'd like to raise the rate when water gets scarce, we run into an equity problem, right? We're raising the rates on everyone, rates are going up, and we might have some customers that have a really hard time paying. They're trying to, to keep their water use down and they're still subject to these high rates. So one of the things that, that agencies have done to innovate in that regard is to introduce what's called an increasing block rate. And this looks like a staircase, okay? So if you use just a little bit of water, you pay a low price per unit. But if you start to use more water, it jumps up to a higher price per unit. And if you use even more water, it jumps up again. Okay, so if you do have customers who only want a little bit of water because they have a low ability to pay for that water, then they get to pay a low rate per unit as well. And that seems, most people would say that seems pretty fair, that seems pretty equitable. And then if you're going to be a large consumer of water and put additional stress on that delivery system, you're going to start paying higher and higher prices for more and more water that you use. And again, I think a lot of people would say, seems fair. Well, one problem with that again gets back to this idea that we want to use prices to send signals about scarcity. And if you have some people consuming in that first tier where there's low prices and other people consuming in that last tier where there's high prices, they face different messages about the relative scarcity of water. The people in the low tier might think, well, prices are low, water, we must have a lot of water, we're going to keep using more. And that's not necessarily a good thing from this societal perspective of efficiency. And so one of the most recent pricing innovations is to take that staircase, right? And instead of telling everybody that every household gets 10 units at the low price, 10 units at the middle price, and the rest of it at the high price, you adjust those volumes based on household characteristics. So if you have a small household, you're going to get less water at the lowest price. If you have a big household, meaning you have a lot of people who live there, you're going to get more water at the lowest price, okay? And then if you have, the second tier is usually used for uh, outdoor water uses. So if you have a small yard, we figure, well, you don't have much use for outdoor water, so you don't get much water in that next tier. But if you have a large yard, a swimming pool, you live on a big lot, we think you need more water to maintain your landscaping, and so you get more water in that second tier. And so those tiers, the sizes of those blocks, the sizes of the steps, if you will, the widths of the steps, are responsive to household characteristics. And they're also responsive to environmental characteristics. So if you live here in the Coachella Valley where it's hot, you would get more water for a given sized lawn than you would if you lived in coastal Orange County where it's not so hot and there's more moisture in the air. So again, this seems to be a pretty reasonable, pretty fair approach to pricing water and allocating water. How do we do it around the state? Well, there was a survey done by PPIC. Uh, it's getting a little bit old now, but we don't have any newer data on this that I'm aware of. And so back in 2005, and I believe this was a survey of the aqua uh, agencies, uh, we had about half of all public utilities were using increasing block rates. So they were using those staircases with uh, fixed width steps for every customer. About half of public utilities. As of 2008, fewer than 14 utilities statewide were using these allocation-based rates. That's not many at all. Pretty unpopular at that time. But then we had Governor Schwarzenegger's 20 by 2020, California Water Conservation Plan. The goal was a 20% reduction across the state by 2020. And we saw sort of this uptick in interest in allocation-based rates. So from 2009 to 2011, we had nine more utilities adopt allocation-based rates. And since then, since we've had the more recent drought, the, the, the uh, emergency, uh, or the executive order, I mean, we've seen an, another uptick in interest, especially amongst Southern California water agencies. So still though, why the apparent reluctance to adopt what seems like sort of an innovative, fair, uh, potentially efficient way to allocate water? And there are some reasons. One is there's some short-term costs in terms of adopting this new rate structure. You need to have a lot more information about your customers. You have to have information about how many people are living there, the local climate, how much lawn they have, those sorts of things. There's a longer term financial risk because you're switching from something you know, your old rate structure, to something you don't know, and it's still pretty innovative, so there's sort of that early adopter risk. There's some legal questions. Prop 218 is one of those. But last, and the thing I'm going to focus on today, is that at the time that we started doing our studies, which I'll talk about next, people didn't really know if it was worth the trouble. You can go through all this cost and risk, and are you really going to get any conservation out of these new rate structures? And so that's sort of the question that we're going to address for the rest of my time. So a couple case studies I'm going to present for you, two different agencies that adopted these allocation-based or water budget-based rates. 
One is Eastern Municipal Water District, which is just in Western Riverside County, and the other is Moulton Niguel Water District down in Orange County. And I'm gonna, I won't go through all the details on these slides, but Eastern switched from uniform rates, which is that uniform flat price per unit, no matter how much you consume, to allocation-based rates in April of 2009. And what this shows you here is that they have four different price tiers. This is the lowest price tier. And I think most recently this price was just under $2 per 100 cubic feet. This is the highest price tier. These are their words, by the way, indoor, outdoor, excessive, and wasteful. I think they had another term, abusive, but their customers didn't like it, so they changed that. Um, this is the highest price tier, and most recently this, I think, is close to $12 per 100 cubic feet. So there's a big difference between the lowest price and the highest price. And these formulas just show you how you calculate how much water you get in each one of those tiers. So to figure out how much water you get at the lowest price, they look at your household size, your per person allowance, and some other factors here. To calculate your outdoor water use budget, they look at evapotranspiration, which is a measure of climate. <clears throat> they have a uh, conversion factor. This is the amount of irrigated area that you have and some other parameters as well. These two things together, are called your water budget. Um, and if you go above your water budget, you get into these penalty tiers. So the goal was to promote water conservation while they maintain their fiscal balance. And the question that we, what, that we wanted to answer was, well, how much conservation did they really get by switching from that old rate structure to this new one? So uh, we conducted a study, and just so you know what we're talking about, here's the Eastern Municipal Water District. So there's Riverside right there. And this is Moulton de Gell, a smaller district down there. And here's all the households in Eastern service area. There's a Diamond Valley Lake and there's Lake Paris. All the yellow dots are households that are in our study. So we collected a long data set going back to 2008, I think it was, maybe before that. And we looked at household use from 2008 through the rate structure change into a couple years past the rate structure change. And what we basically did was we built this statistical model to describe household demand under the old rate structure and then we use it to predict what we think demand would have been had the water agency not changed their rates, but had they maintained that old rate structure and adjusted the price just a little bit to control for the fact that people paid on average a little bit more for water under the new rate structure. So we're kind of going to predict this hypothetical situation and say, suppose they didn't switch, what do we think would have happened? So this slide just shows you the difference between our model, which is the blue line, and the red line, which is actual water consumption in eastern service area, you see it bounces up and down a lot because of seasonality, summertime irrigation. You can also see that we can do a pretty good job of describing demand. So hopefully that has you convinced that we can also do a good job of predicting demand under that scenario where they didn't change their rate structure. And that's what this next slide is going to show you. So on the next slide, you're going to see this same data, but I'm going to smooth it out over the seasons so you won't see it bounce up and down so much. And you'll see our predictions. So this is the data on the previous slide, but I've smoothed it out over the course of a year so you don't see the seasonality. This is the rate structure change. This is what demand actually did. It dropped off and it stayed kind of low. And this blue line is what we think demand would have done if they hadn't changed their rates. We think it would have dropped because prices went up a little bit. We also had the recession. Incomes went down a little bit. We also had some beneficial changes in the weather. But then we think that it would have rebounded and come back up here, but it didn't. And so this difference here, we attribute to the new policy, the new rate structure. And that difference is about 10 to 15%. So a 10 to 15% reduction, and the average price of water only went up by 3%. If they were to have tried to achieve this reduction, this 10 to 15% reduction with the old rate structure, they would have had to raise prices by about 30% in order to get there. So good for the customers, good in terms of conservation. Here, if we break up that rate structure effect, if you will, that sort of conservation effect that they got out of their rate structure change, we can break it up according to how efficient different households are in terms of water consumption. And what this slide shows you is that the more efficient households, well, most recently, at least in the most recent data that we have, the most efficient households are this blue line, and they're only about 5% below where we think they'd be under the old rates. The least efficient households are about 25 to 30% below where we think they would be under the old rates. So this was, the district was glad to hear this because they have been telling their customers, trust us, 
if you're already an inefficient water user, this policy change isn't going to affect you very much. It's going to affect the people who are inefficient users because they're the ones who end up in the higher price tiers. And that looks like it's exactly what happened. Um, okay, let me say something. So this is what we call a demand effect, right? It sort of describes how people responded in terms of how much water they wanted to consume. That's one way we can measure the effect of the policy. The other way we can f measure the effect of the policy is with this economic concept of welfare. And I don't mean like social welfare programs. I mean like measuring people's well-being, okay? So the sort of the analog here is that if someone does something bad to you, right, you can potentially take them to court and we can legitimately talk about compensation that would make you whole again, right? Well, if a policy affects you negatively, we can also talk about compensation that would make you as well off as you were before the policy change. And if a policy makes you better off, we can equivalently talk about sort of how much compensation we might take away from you to get you back to where you were before the policy change. So economists use currency as a way to measure changes in well-being. All right? It doesn't mean that uh, all the people value is money. It, we just use currency as the measurement. Okay? So we did the similar analysis with this rate structure. We said, well, I wonder how much better off or worse off the customers were under this rate structure change versus how much better off or worse off they'd be under the old policy with that flat or that uniform rate. So I got a bunch of numbers on this table, but I just want to point out to you a couple of them. This number right here, this positive number, means that on average, the customers in Eastern Municipal Water District were made better off by that rate structure change. Prices went up a little bit on average. Some people undoubtedly feel like they've been made worse off. But on average, all throughout the district, the average response was a positive response in terms of welfare. Consumers feel like they're a little bit better off on average than they used to be. Compare that to what their old rate structure would have been, and you see a negative number right here. Consumers would have been made worse off on average if they had used their old rate structure to achieve the same conservation. So they're achieving this conservation. The most inefficient users are largely the ones who are doing the conservation and who are suffering in a welfare sense. The con but the other customers, the average customers, are actually turning out, it's turning out positive for them. Okay, so here's the other case study. We did the same thing to Molten Niguel's, Molten Niguel Water District down in Orange County. They had a similar situation where they went from, although this time they went from a uh, fixed increasing block rate to a budget-based increasing block rate. And we've got the same graph here where we've got their observed consumption in blue. It was dropping before the rate change. It rebounded a little bit, and then it kind of leveled off after the rate change. That dashed line right there shows where the rates changed. The orange line, again, is our model. And what we think would have happened for Molten Niguel is that they would have seen this big increase in consumption under the old rates, and then it would have gone away. And most recently, we don't see much difference at all between the old rate structure and the new rate structure. So what this looks to me like is what people in the electricity world call peak shaving, right? Because if I were to show you what the weather looked like from about, what is this, September of 2011 through June of 2013, in that area there was this unusually warm dry period, okay? And it, it appears in the evapotranspiration data and it maps exactly onto this bump right here. But then things got back to normal and it looks like there's really no difference between consumption under the old rates and consumption under the new rates. But the nice thing is they saved about 5,000 acre feet of water during this event right here by being under the new rate structure. So we thought, started asking ourselves, why the difference between Eastern's results and Molten Niguel's results? Why the bump versus the persistent effect? Well, when we break it down by inefficient users, we looked at the inefficient users in Molten Niguel. Here's what we get, and it's the same story. There's this persistent, conservation effect of this rate structure, but this time it's only on the most inefficient users rather than on the, the typical user in their service area. And there's some reasons for that. Um, Eastern's users were less inefficient on average to begin with, and those inefficient users were relatively more wasteful than the inefficient users in Molten's service area. So they basically had you know, more room for improvement and they made more improvement, whereas the improvement from Molten's service area was more limited to those people who were only inefficient to begin with. But there's also some differences in the rates that they adopted, and I'll show you what the rate structures look like. So here's that staircase I mentioned, and what we did was we picked a household that had characteristics that wouldn't be surprising to find in either Molten Service Area or Eastern Service Area, 
and we calculated the sizes of those blocks. So these are the volumetric sizes of the blocks, and then these are the prices up here. So in Eastern Service Area, the orange line, you see that prices are below $2 up until about 900 cubic feet per month. Then they jump up to, I don't know what this is, between $2 and $3, over here to about 2,300 cubic feet per month. Then they jump up above 4 and eventually up here. Molten's price structure is a little bit different for the same household. Okay, It stays lower initially, but eventually it gets a lot higher. So there's bigger penalties for people who are, let's just call it wasting a lot of water, but it's more generous for, for people who are moderately efficient water users. Okay, And this probably has something to do with those results also. That because Eastern is a bit more aggressive through this region right, right here, where more customers find themselves located, those customers are inclined to conserve more. Molten Niguel is a little bit more generous to that region. They're conserving a bit less. More evidence that prices work and that people are particularly focused on getting out of these highly priced tiers so that their water bills stay, stay low. All right, so that's actually what I had prepared for today. I'll just give a quick summary. What we saw in our, in our research is uh, demand reductions of up to 15% consistently through time, persistent reductions, and up to 30% by inefficient users across these two water districts. Those are pretty significant, especially when you put them in the perspective of what uh, the State Water Resources Control Board has asked uh, the state to achieve, or I guess the governor has asked the state to achieve. We, get, we see larger reductions when the initial inefficiency of users is lower, and larger reductions when those middle tier prices are lower or more generous. So this is all consistent with what we would expect. We also see some evidence that um, the reductions by these inefficient users are, are resilient in the sense that when prices decline a little bit, when the economy rebounds a little bit, when the, what, when the weather changes, they don't use as much water as we would think that they would under those conditions. And it suggests that maybe there's some habit formation going on. That these higher prices cause people to take actions they wouldn't otherwise take, and then they realize, oh, that's not so bad. Save some water, uh, water bill went down, feel good about what I'm doing for the environment and for, the, for uh, other people in the state. I think I might just keep this habit. And then conditions change and you think you're going to see a rebound and you don't see as much of a rebound as you would expect. I can't say for sure that's what, ha what is happening, but that's consistent with what we see in the data. And I think I already mentioned this last point here, which is that in Eastern Service Area, and unfortunately I don't have the same statistic for Molten Niguel, the real average price only rose by about 3% after that policy change. That's, that's not much when you think about typical inflation rates. But it would have had to rise 30% under the old price structure to get the same demand effect that we observe in the data. So again, I think this speaks to the conservation potential of this particular type of rate structure while also, as I said at the beginning, addressing concerns about equity. So thanks very much, and I guess I'm sticking around to answer questions. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, and if I could invite the panel up here. Um, it's going to be your turn now to ask questions, and I have a half a dozen questions already here. I'm going to, I'll sit there, yeah. Actually, I have one first, though, and this is for Kathleen. Uh, Aqua's in charge of, <laughs> or, or, or its goal is to, you know, help form water policy throughout the state and to kind of engage in education throughout the state. Did you hear anything particular from our economist and our uh, public opinion research that you found surprising or it's going to inform what you do or is this all kind of old news to... Well, I, I, I wish that, there it goes, I wish that the public recognized what it takes to maintain a reliable water supply. So I'm, I'm not shocked by the results of your polling where the majority chose not to support rate increases for that purpose, but that's what we're all about is to try to help them understand what it takes to get that water to your home and to your business. So not, not blown away by it, but that just gives us more of an opportunity to help to continue to educate them. A sample of the challenge that you face when you're out there. Very much so. Okay, okay uh, 
I'll go through these questions now. The state frowns on the charging more than 30% for cost recovery of fixed costs, even if the fixed cost is a lot higher. Is this policy going to change? I, I don't know. <laughs> Ken, could you elaborate a little bit on what the question is? Did you? Well, it's actually, um, I can speak to, you know, the importance of covering fixed costs in the industry, but I don't know that that's actually what the, the person asking the question was, was getting at. Um, and, and maybe what I should say is that, um, you know, one of the things we hope to do with our work is to expand it to include the financial side of different rate structures. And I think that's what the person asking the question is getting at, which is that there are a lot of constraints on agencies, um, financial constraints just being one big category. And those constraints affect their ability to plan. It affects their ability to maintain infrastructure. It affects how much they charge customers for water. Um, and it sounds like uh, this particular constraint is viewed as one that is unnecessary and perhaps causing more problem than it is causing benefit. Uh, but I actually cannot, I'm not familiar with the specifics of this particular question, which is why I'm looking at my colleagues here, but perhaps none of us is. <laughs> I think that, and again, if the person asking the question, and, and you kind of alluded to it where you were talking about the commodity versus the fixed rate, fixed charge, um, that's what a lot of agencies are starting to transition to because as we've seen as a result of the drought and as Ken alluded to, when people started conserving, the revenue stream dropped down significantly, but the fixed costs were still up here. Hence, the drought rates or rate increases were necessary to maintain those fixed costs. And the, the uh, person asking the question might have also been alluding to the Capistrano judgment and cost of service when you set your rates. So again, I encourage everyone get to know your water district and learn while they base their rates. Well, that was a nice segue, because the next question actually, I think, comes from the Capistrano decision. It says, Ken, pricing must be tied to the cost of providing service. What is the future of tiered rates? <laughs> right, so that's had a lot of uh, discussion in the popular press and you know, between myself and colleagues as well, economists and attorneys and, and people who work in the California water policy scene. Um, so let me preface what I'm about to say with, I'm not an attorney, but I'll give you my, my view of, of the decision and, and what, and you know, where I see things going. When we first heard about the decision, it was sort of like, oh, this blow to um, allocation-based rates and perhaps also increasing block rates uh, because of the, of the negative judgment in San Juan Capistrano. But when you read the decision closely, what you see is that the courts were saying, they actually went out of their way to say, that they see the merit in these kinds of, of innovative price structures. But they also undoubtedly see that the people of California want it done in a particular way, and they felt that the way that it was done in San Juan Capistrano didn't meet the bar. The big question is, where's the bar? At least that's what I think the big question is, because um, it's one thing to say you didn't meet the bar. It's another thing to say you were really close and here's how you'd get there, versus you are not even in the ballpark, right? And I, at this point, don't have an answer for that question. But um, based on my reading of the decision, I think that we will see um, adjustments to how people do allocation-based rates, to how they justify that revenue cost nexus um, but I don't think that we're going to see it going away. Um, I also think that we might see, perhaps not this year, but maybe next year or later, an effort to address you know, the restrictions that Prop 218 places on water agencies through, through the Constitution. It's, I think everybody agrees it's a very good idea for public agencies to not uh, be able to overcharge customers. Right? They're not supposed to run profits. They're not supposed to earn profits. But it's another thing to constrain them so tightly that we create this additional big problem inadvertently. And that's kind of where I think we found ourselves. So there could be an effort on the legal side to produce another option for agencies to satisfy constitutionally, uh, but I don't think that the decision is going to prove to be the death knell of, of increasing block rate water pricing. Thank you. The next one is for Kathy. Many agencies deferred the cost of some maintenance activities on their water systems to keep rates low. 
Is this a good idea? No. <laughs> and and you, you see the result of this, uh, not necessarily out in your area here, but I'm sure on the evening news, uh, when I see L.A. County, and, and I've, I always think it's that game that you see in the arcades where they've got the holes and the, the pegs are popping up and the guy's sitting there with a hammer trying to pop each one down. Well, if you look at, at L.A. streets, their poor infrastructure has had it. And so they have deferred maintenance on that and they're paying the price. And I was speaking with someone earlier and I was talking about rate increases and I said, we, we get accustomed to rate increases if they're done incrementally on a regular basis. It's just the cost of living continues to go up in every aspect of our lives. It's those that defer and don't do anything for a number of years, unfortunately, and then when they do see a red flag and they need money, all of a sudden then they're going back to their rate payers and they're not asking for a three or four percent increase, they're asking for a double digit increase and then the ratepayers are not happy with them whatsoever, so. I'll tell you, we're the ones that get the call when that's the case. So uh, we're the ones that get the call when there's this scenario of an agency hasn't raised their rates for two years, three years, five years, and it's that double digit increase. And again, it, it, it may only be, um, and I don't say it lightly only, it may only be five or six dollars a month, but, but which to some people isn't a lot, to some people is significant, but it's 10 or 15 or 20 percent, and that sounds dramatic. And all of a sudden, you're in this situation where we're called because we have to poll it, and you've got to start doing messaging and doing significant outreach because they haven't done this periodic review and this periodic increase to make sure they're recovering the cost that they need to recover. And um, if they were doing it on a regular basis, their customers wouldn't be up in arms and they wouldn't be protesting. So um, I think it'd be much smarter to do it on a regular basis. I'd just like to make one comment, and, and I find it fascinating, obviously just because of my passion for water. But when the drought hit, uh, the sales of bottled water went up because there is that class of people that think that the water in a bottle comes from a different source than the water out of your tap. So they don't mind going and, and paying for water in a bottle and if you were to take that bottle of water and the same amount coming out of the tap, that 12 or 16 ounce bottle of water is the equivalent of about $1,000 for that water. Whereas if you take that 12 ounces and, and fill it from your tap, you're less, less than half a cent, less than that. So it, it's pretty, it's, people are innovative also. They're, they're not using the water at home, but they're buying it because it's coming from another source. Okay, why is water conservation for homeowners and not for businesses? Uh, I work in the hospitality industry. I believe it is both businesses and homeowners. So if you're, if the person asking the question is businesses such as restaurants or businesses such as industrial processes, is that your question? For restaurants or industrial? What happens is uh, the hospitality industry, if you, uh, if I, if you go in and you stack and say 1.8 million gallons of water and all you have to do is this one simple thing, they're in the valley here, they say, we don't need this, who cares how much water I use, it doesn't matter. It took a lot of research, I'm a research scientist from the aerospace industry, but anyway, I did research to find out why the industry doesn't really want to conserve water. Well, number one, a lot of them have wells out here. A lot of the hospitality facilities that have wells, so they don't care how much water they use, number one. Number two, it's a tax write-off. It's, there's so much way that we could save water in the valley from the hospitality industry out here, but even the county, I've gone to the county. I don't want to say names or anything, I'm trying to be generic. I went to a local uh, facility that uses millions of gallons of water say, you know, we could, all we have to do is this one little simple thing, we don't care. Somehow we've not gotten from the public to
to the industrial people that use a lot of water. You know, how, how hotels use a lot of water because they all have laundromats. I support those laundromats. That's why I have all the statistics and stuff on my computer of their water usage and what have you. And actually to say this is what we can do to save water, they don't, it doesn't mean anything to them. How do we, what is it that we can do to educate them that it is important? And also the other thing is. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Yeah. Why don't we answer that question and then we'll move on. Is there. I would say that the hospitality industry is responding, maybe not to the level that you would like to see, but I don't believe there should not be a restaurant anywhere that you go into and there's a glass of water sitting in front of you without you asking for that glass of water. There's a lot more water used in cleaning. That's why you're asking for that glass of water. I agree with you. So it, it, it gets back to the water districts and it gets back to education, which is what you just said. We're doing our best and we'll continue to do better. From a hospitality standpoint, I think every hotel you go to in California has the the, the same information to you know save your uh, save your towels, and uh, every every restaurant you go to into California has that information about uh, you know why they don't put a, a glass of water on your uh, table. So I think hospitality and restaurants in California are doing their part. Okay, and if you'd like to discuss that further, maybe you can after the program, you could approach the folks in the lobby. Uh, why do different agencies have different costs? Why not just one mega agency? <laughs> Local control. <laughs> um, again, you go back to the infrastructure, so I don't know that um, Coachella Valley Water District, I don't know that they've got the pipelines to get their delicious water all the way to the folks out in Santa Monica or down in San Diego. So everybody has their own source. Um, again, out here they've got a beautiful groundwater basin, whereas you get in some areas, they're totally reliant on imported water. They have no benefit of groundwater. So every, and they've got watersheds coming down to them. So everyone's different, and it requires special districts, and I say that lovingly, but they are special districts, to basically focus on the delivery of the water and the wastewater services for their respective areas. And unfortunately for us, that's the case because our water rates are so much lower than the rest of the state. Well, we'll so take your rates. <laughs> you know, the rest of the state would love to have our rate, right? No, I, I mean, it just speaks to the point of, of why, you know, we have great, interesting results statewide, but why the, the results are so unique on a, on a um, region by region basis and even, you know, obviously by a, on a district by district basis. Uh, you know, in Orange County, we've got this beautiful groundwater basin that you know, affords us the ability to import less imp water. Um, and like you know, this gentleman says, there's you know, potential wells for certain customers uh, in the valley, but uh, you know, San Diego, for instance, has z virtually no groundwater whatsoever. Uh, and so they have to import every bit of, every drop of water that they use. Uh, in Northern California, you know, for a long bit of history, you know, people didn't even have water meters at all. They just consumed water, no problem. They didn't care whatsoever because they just didn't have a problem with any water. They just could they use, consume whatever they wanted. Uh, so as far as California goes, we are entirely unique regions and um, there's very disparate parts of the state as far as water goes. Uh, and so it's just, which is very, very different as far as water uh, and very different costs as far as total water, bringing water, and, and um, uh, we're very unique, obviously. California, you know, there, there's efforts to make California, what, six or eight different states? Um, and uh, <laughs> so you could probably draw many more lines uh, based upon the kinds of uh, ways we get our water. Uh, how many watersheds are there in California? There's probably you know, a whole lot more than that. Uh, so, uh, very different ways we get our water. All right, moving on, this one is for Kathy and Adam. What are you hearing from around the state about messages that work in selling uh, rate increases? About the messages that are being used? Oh, what, is, what is the most effective message? Oh gosh, the, the water, and I've said it a number of times today, water has been undervalued. 
water, people are so accustomed to, to paying, uh, in my opinion, basically nothing for water in relationship to the other utilities that they pay for. Um, the Save Our Water program, which is a statewide program, is trying to, again, help people understand the value of water and the need for water. The message is, is universal throughout, throughout the state of California. That, and I'll see it again, and I, I'll take all the tomatoes in the room that are out there, but the cost of water is going up. I don't care where you are in the state of California. Again, it's been alluded to some will be incremental, others are gonna be more significant, but when you've got, again, all that's associated with water, it's got to go up. I don't see the cost of water going down, and I would ask my elected colleagues in the office, in, in the auditorium, I doubt seriously any of them would say the water costs are gonna go down. So, we find that ratepayers uh, appreciate and understand that uh, water costs money and that there's great value in water and that uh, they appreciate the job that their water districts do. Uh, we do polling and we do focus groups. So when people like uh, you in this audience come to our focus groups, um, we actually find that there's kind of less of an interest in identifying you know, where it is the costs of water come from and, and why water costs what it does, um, but more of an interest in understanding, um, uh, understanding the, uh, w what it is that the, the water districts are, are doing for you and quite frankly, uh, making sure that their operations are efficient and that they are providing, uh, quite frankly, a good value. And so when you, uh, as ratepayers, understand that they're doing a good job and being transparent with their operations, you are much freer with your dollars. And by freer, I mean you're willing to pay a couple more dollars a month uh, or uh, you know, more dollars a, a year to make sure that you have reliable drinking water and reliable and pay for reliability projects like reservoirs, like uh, making sure that the pipes are, are uh, uh, kept up. And so those are the kinds of things we find. And it's interesting, in, if you find in a particular agency, for instance, that they have a message that says, look, we haven't hired, uh, we haven't grown our employee base over the course of the last decade by more than X percent. Or if you have an agency that has some message that they can hold on to, like we get other revenue through putting cell phone towers on our, our, um, our above ground reservoirs. And even if it's only $10,000 a month and they've got you know, a dozen above ground reservoirs, that's something that you as ratepayers can hold on to that says, you know what, they're doing something to offset my rates. You know, it may only be a couple pennies on my, on my bill that they're covering over the course of all the different ratepayers, but they're doing something to offset my rates. Or they are recovered, they're not, um, they're, they're, they're requiring their uh, employees to cover a little bit more of their pension costs so that I'm not, as a ratepayer, picking up all that cost. Uh, or uh, the employees, uh, you know, or, or didn't get a, a full raise. Sorry for the um, employees of some of the water districts here. Uh, you know, they, they only got a 2% raise last year, not a 5% rate like raise last year. Messages like that resonate with ratepayers so that, that the ratepayers understand that the, the agency is being efficient with their dollars and, and making sure that they know that their rates aren't going up entirely because uh, of, let's say, employee costs. So little messages like that that we test really make it, those slides pop and make people excited about, not, maybe not excited about the idea of their rates going up, but make them more comfortable with the idea that, okay, uh, I'm gonna contribute a little more to the cost of water uh, because uh, my water district is being efficient with my dollars. Okay, we have, uh, I've got a whole bunch of good questions here, but we're running out of time and I'm getting told we have time for one more. And it, it goes back to, uh, messaging, and I'll just read it and then try to interpret it. How has ratepayer perception impacted by assurances by districts of an abundance of water? 
So there's a certain amount of tension out there, and I think particularly in the Coachella Valley where um, on one hand we're telling people to conserve, on the other hand we're uh, approving development and having the assurance that, you know, that there is enough water to take care of all our needs. So how do you see that tension playing out? Maybe I'll jump in with a quick comment about messaging and what I can say from, from an economic standpoint. Um, I have a colleague who works on water economics uh, for a university in Canada. And he conducted a survey to try to figure out if there was, uh, to what extent there was a link between understanding of current water issues, which might be your perception of water abundance or water scarcity, and your efforts to conserve water in your home. And um, so the idea was that if you're better educated about the real circumstances that we're facing, that you'll be more inclined to undertake the behavior that your water agency might be asking you to undertake. And he couldn't establish any link. So as an educator, I'm a little bummed out about this. <laughs> um, but interestingly, what they did find, and, and this paper hasn't yet gone through peer review, so you can keep that in mind, but um, they found a link between um, the number of different times and places where you had seen messages about water conservation and your inclination to conserve water. So based on that study, it's more about advertising than it is about education. It's almost like we need a really good you know, catchphrase. We either need a Smokey the Bear for water or we need a you know, buckle up or don't drink and drive. You know, none of us knows what the statistics are behind any of those things, right? None of us really knows. Uh, what the fire risk is, or you know, what the likelihood is that if we don't buckle up in a car, we might get hurt, or, or worse. But we do these things, and and we're all familiar with the advertising campaigns, right? So um, it's a preliminary result, but I think it's an interesting one, and it it sort of fits with my view of how I think you know most customers feel, which is that we are constantly bombarded with information, and we have to kind of pick: Am I going to pay attention to that? Am I going to pay attention to that? And so you kind of, when you try to educate someone, you're asking them to invest their time in understanding this message that you're giving to them. When you advertise, you're just trying to flash something in front of them that sort of sticks in their memory. Maybe that's the way to go. I don't, I don't know, but there's a suggestion that perhaps it is. I'd like to make a comment from my own personal experience. And it was like social pressure more than anything else because the, I, I get these water bills where it says I was inefficient or I was wasteful and I was offended. You know, and so it, it, Abusive even, right? Abusive water use. Yeah, well, I didn't get, we didn't have that one here, but you know, the amount of money, you know, as you say, in comparison to what I pay for cable and everything else was, wasn't that much, but there was kind of a social pressure to be responsible in terms of water use, and I think that message, at least for me, really resonated. Just on the, on the subject of, I, I think maybe what that question was getting at was this idea of, you know, perhaps how can you build you know, new houses perhaps when we're supposed to be conserving water. Um, and, and this is something we've done a lot of research on. Uh, and uh, we recently did some focus groups on this subject. And uh, we ended up getting support for the idea of new development uh, in the face of the need to conserve when we explained to people that new development is uh, significantly more uh, water conscious uh, than older homes, older apartments, and even the uses that would have been and were on those lands prior. So if you had agriculture, let's say, on a piece of land, and you then develop it into, let's say, an apartment building or a home, that land is now much more water efficient than the, the ag that was there before. Or if you tear down, let's say, an old house or an old apartment building and put new housing there, and you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're putting brand new homes there, and we're in this drought. You know, I can't believe the city council or the board of supervisors approved those new pro that new project. You know, how can they do that? Well, <clears throat> those new homes are, I forget, forget the statistics, 30 or 40%, I think it's 50% actually, more water efficient because of the landscape and the interior design and the, and the, uh, the new appliances than what was there before. And that message definitely resonated in that focus group and presumably it resonates with people beyond because it's that much more water efficient. Um, and so. Did you, any of you want to wrap up with one last comment because we're basically out of time. Drink from the tap. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, 
I'd like to thank, thank you all for being such an attentive audience, and I'd certainly like to thank our panel for coming down and sharing their expertise, and I believe they'll stay around for a while and answer any additional questions you have. And thanks to John for, and Ashley for pulling all this together. And did you want to yeah. closing remarks? Thanks, you. Uh, let's side. thank Bob for a great job moderating. And I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, UCR, our host. Thank you very much. Uh, this location is wonderful. How many got a little different perspective tonight after hearing from these uh, great panelists? Uh, a quick note, one of Kathy's slides uh, showed different water costs up and down the state. You know, the most expensive water in the state up in the Bay Area, they're, at their rate, it's still eight-tenths of a penny per gallon. Here, it's around three tenths of a penny per gallon right now. That's what you pay for water. And I, I spend a buck 29 on a, a half liter bottle on a regular basis sometimes if I'm going out and doing something. I uh, also want to acknowledge the five agencies of CV Water Counts and their representatives here. Thanks for helping out putting this together. And other than that, I think I got everybody in here. Thank you all, especially you, for coming and making it worthwhile. We appreciate you coming out, listening, and learning, and sharing information with your friends. Uh, like us on Facebook, CV Water Counts, and otherwise, have a great evening. <laughs>